Pentecost Sunday. This is the day that kind of represents um, whenever Jesus died. He died at Passover. And then it, within the Jewish calendar, they would have Passover. They would have the Feast of Weeks, which was seven weeks. And then on the 50th day was Pentecost, the 50th day after Passover. And it was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in Jerusalem on the disciples and the 120 that were gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came and the church was birthed that day. And so Pentecost, we are a Pentecostal church. We are part of the Elam movement it is an Elam Pentecostal denomination. We are part of that. So basically to be a Pentecostal means that we believe that the Holy Spirit still moves today. That everything that the Holy Spirit was doing in the book of Acts, that he's still doing today. And I want to be a part of that. And so in Acts chapter 1, and the words will be on the screen, the, 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 the verses will be on the screen. It says, after his suffering, talking about, about Jesus, after Jesus had suffered, he presented himself to them. Now talking about the disciples, what it's saying is, after Jesus had suffered, after he had died, after he had rose again from the dead, he presented himself to the disciples and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive and I think that even in those days whenever they still came face to face with Jesus that they still struggled with the fact that he was alive that they still kind of tr were trying to wrap their heads around he was dead he was put in a term we've we seen him on the cross we've seen the state that he that, that the Romans had left him in he was dead, put in a tomb. The tomb was sealed. He was dead. And now he's, he's, he's alive. And I think that they even in, in many ways struggled and trying to wrap their heads around, what's going on here? How is it that he's dead and now he's alive and he's with us and he's before us? And Jesus, we're told, gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. This is what Christianity is all about. It's about who one who was dead, but who is alive and who is alive forevermore. He is alive with us for eternity as his bride, as his church, his children, his sons and daughters of the most high God. We will reign with him for eternity in heaven. Paul says that if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then everything that we're teaching, everything that we believe is all for nothing. It is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no other, if you can use the word religion or faith or belief within the world that claims that their Savior rose again from the dead. But Christianity does. It is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, that the tomb is empty. And so we're told Jesus Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he is alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Wait. He's with them. He's eating with them. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, the one who was dead but who is alive in his resurrected body, he's sitting and he's eating with them. And he tells them, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the gift that my father has promised there's a gift coming. I want you to wait for it. It's been promised to you. And then it goes on in verse 8. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he tells him, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere. Wait for the gift. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to be filled with power. You're going to be filled with power. Whenever you get a gift, do you ever get something that, that's wrapped up? You get a gift that's wrapped up. And, and someone will come and they'll give you the gift. And what's the first thing that you say to them? I don't say thank you. <laughs> you're, you're standing there. They've taken all the time to wrap up this gift. 
put a little bow on it, put a label on it, it's got your name and it's got their name on it saying that it's from them. And they give you and it's all wrapped up. And the first thing that you'll say is, well, there's probably two things. Well, number one is, you shouldn't have done that. And then the other thing that you'll say is, what is it? We'll open it up and find out. We get these gifts, and what, what is it? What, what is it? Well, if you open it up, then you'll find out what it is. And so Jesus tells the disciples there's a gift coming. The Father has promised a gift. And the disciples don't know what it is. Jesus has been talking to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but they don't know what they're waiting on. They know they've been taught by Jesus about the Holy Spirit and what he's going to do and, and how he's going to interact with them and how he's going to lead them and guide them. But they have absolutely no concept. They're, they're, they cannot read back to a point in time where something like what happened in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 happened again. There are instances in the Old Testament where you've got prophets and in the days of, 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 of Saul and, and of Moses where there is prophecy, but there is nothing that has ever taken place where the Holy Spirit comes in the way that he does in Acts chapter 2. And so the disciples have got no point of reference on this is what it's going to look like. This is what it's going to be like. All Jesus tells them is, wait in Jerusalem for the gift that has been promised by my Father in heaven. Well, what is it? What is it? Well, wait, and you'll find out. And then in Acts chapter 2, they are gathered together. So Jesus ascends. He, he meets with them for 40 days. Paul talks about meeting with, with about four or 500 people over a period of 40 days, giving those many convincing proofs. And then he ascends into heaven. He's gone, and the disciples are gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem, waiting on a gift, and they don't know what they're waiting on. They don't know what they're waiting for. They're, they've got no point of reference of what it's going to be like or what it's going to look like. They are just waiting, and then one day, the day of Pentecost came, Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place suddenly, out of nowhere. Suddenly, as they're gathered together like we are here today, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I'm open to one day whenever I read this here that a wind is going to blow through. That's, that's my longing is that someday whenever I read this here and I'm standing on the platform is that suddenly a wind blows through. A wind, a violent wind erupts in this place. Suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I believe that God wants to fill us. So we need to be filled with His Holy Spirit. Not just today, because today is the day of Pente it's Pentecost Sunday. But I believe that we should be continually being filled. We're going to talk about that as we come to a close. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is known as the third person in the Trinity. It's not that God the Father, you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's not that God the Father is the boss. He's the Father, and he tells the other two what to do doesn't work like that. He is co-equal. The Holy Spirit is he, God is one, one God in three persons. He is Father, He is Son, and He is Holy Spirit. Co-equal, co-eternal, they work with each other. He is one God, but three persons. So the Holy Spirit is not a force, not a feeling, not a thing, not an it. He is a person. He is God. That's who we're talking about here today. And He wants to fill us today. There are things that I believe that are essential to our growth and development as Christians. It doesn't finish, you know, getting saved is not the be all and end all. Getting saved is only the starting point that God wants to do so much more in every single one of us. And I believe that the filling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential to our growth and development as Christians. I don't believe that Christianity is simply about getting saved and then we live a nice life when we come to church on Sunday. 
That's not for me what Christianity is all about, right? Well, I've turned over a new leaf. I'm going to be a nice person. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm not going to do all this stuff here anymore. And I'm just going to be a nice person. There are plenty of nice people in the world who aren't Christians. There are probably nicer people in the world who aren't Christians than some people who are Christians, but that's a whole other story. And I don't believe for one second that Jesus was beaten and whipped and marred and disfigured in the way that he was nailed to a cross just so that we could be nice people. I don't think that that was the point of the cross. Just so that we could be nice Christians, nice people, and come to church on Sunday and whenever else we feel like it. I believe that it is about so much more than that. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Have it to the max. Have it in abundance, overflowing with me. All that I am, Jesus is saying. I can't think of a more boring Christian life to live than just coming to church on Sunday. Ticking a box, right? Well, I went on Sunday, read my Bible a few times during the week, prayed a few times during the week, job done. I believe that it's so much more than that. I believe that God wants to do so much more in us and through us. Jesus lived his life on mission. Even from the age of 12, he's, with, he's in the temple and he says, I must be about my father's business. He lived his life on mission. What a mission it was. That mission would take him to the cross. The purpose of the cross was to redeem us. To redeem means to buy back. So they, they would do that in the slave market where people would come and they would buy slaves with the sole objective of just to release the slaves, to set them free. And so Jesus comes, he dies on a cross to redeem us, to buy us back, to, to set us free. But it's again, even so much more than that. You see, it was all about restoring relationship. God has always wanted relationship with us. In the Garden of Eden, God came and he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. He, he was about relationship. We've been singing about Jesus coming to, to chase us down, to pursue us, to catch hold of us. He wants relationship. And so the purpose of the cross was about not just redeeming us and not just about, you know, he died for our sins. Yes, he did all of that. But it was also about creating a way to restore relationship with him. And it's even more than that. It, it, it's, it's actually more than, than him dying on a cross for our sins. It's more than calling us into relationship with him. All of the things I think are, are a stepping stone to be saved, salvation because of the cross, coming into relationship. But he then calls us to partner with him. He invites us to partner with him in the mission that he talked about in the temple at the age of 12. I must be about my father's business. And he calls us, he invites us into that same mission. I think that we all love an invitation we all love to get an invite to the party. There's a big birthday party happening when we get this invitation. I'm sure before you know how that we, we got an invitation to Buckingham Palace. It was amazing because normally whenever you go to London, you, everybody goes and they, they stand outside at the water fountain and, and outside the railings and, and people take photographs outside Buckingham Palace and wonder, what's it like inside? And we got an opportunity, we got an invitation where we didn't just stand on the outside of the railings, but the gate was opened and we were able to walk through the gate and into Buckingham Palace. And it was amazing. I will never forget walking in and seeing the artwork and the soldiers standing there in, their, in the brass. And it was just incredible. There was an invitation. Could you imagine getting that invitation? No, I don't feel like it. I can't be bothered. We have the greatest invitation ever in Jesus inviting us to partner with him in the mission of the Father. That's the invitation that is given to us. Jesus is always handing out invitations to the, to the fishermen. Come, follow me. 
Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm, going to, I'm calling you and inviting you into my mission, into partnering with me. This was the dream of every, of every Jewish boy, to hear the words of a rabbi, follow me. This was how it worked in Judaism in those times, is that the boys would come through a school and they were waiting at some point for a rabbi to come to them and to say, follow me. In other words, the rabbi is saying, I choose you. I choose you. And if they weren't chosen, then they ended up going and doing manual labor like fishing. So what we can kind of take from this here is that at some point, the boys that Jesus called were overlooked. The boys that Jesus called were rejected. They weren't chosen. They weren't picked. And Jesus rocks up and says, follow me. That was the words that they always wanted to hear from a rabbi. Follow me. Not only did they get it from a rabbi, but he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. This is the one that chooses them. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm calling you to partner with me. In the Bible, it talks about, we have a benediction. It says, the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Fellowship means partnership. We are called to partner with the Holy Spirit. You see, as Jesus ascended into heaven and, and the Holy Spirit comes, he's, he then takes over the mission. But it's in partnership with the church, with us. He is inviting us, Holy Spirit is inviting us to partner with him in the mission of Jesus. What an invitation to partner with him. I'm going to say that it's even more than, than Jesus dying on a cross for our sins. It's, it's more than, than salvation. It's more than relationship. It's more than being called into the mission. The, the, the other part of this is that he wants to fill us. He wants to fill you. He wants to fill you. Jesus wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. There are... Four reasons, I'm going to go through these in five minutes. Four reasons why I think that we need the, the filling of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number one is that He energizes us. Or sorry, He enlightens us. He enlightens us to a greater revelation of who Jesus is. You see, one of the objectives of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to Jesus. Is to reveal who Jesus is. One of the primary objectives of the Holy Spirit. You did not choose Jesus. Jesus pursued you. The Holy Spirit pursued you and brought you to a revelation of Jesus. That he's the Messiah. That he died. That he rose again. And then you responded to that invitation of salvation. To that invitation of Jesus to follow me. You responded to it. You didn't choose him. He chose you. He pursued you. The Holy Spirit comes and then he, he causes us to think that Jesus. Yeah, do you know what? Maybe he is. There may have been circumstances that brought you to church. There may have been circumstances that caused you to think about Jesus in a different way. The Holy Spirit was working in you to bring you to Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit enlightens us. There are so many insights and knowledge that we can get from this book. So many insights and knowledge about, about Jesus. But I want to tell you that there are a lot of people that know this book that aren't followers of Jesus. There is the Word, and then there is the Spirit. And a lot of people read this book in order just to win arguments. A lot of people recite this book and, and, and go through this book and try to remember verses in this book with the sole objective of, of winning an argument. And there's a lot of people that, that know this book but don't know Jesus. And whenever you, whenever you read this book under the unction of the Holy Spirit, then you will see Jesus in this book. Your heart will be changed by this word when read in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And whenever we gather around this book, we should be saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Bring Jesus out in this. Speak to my heart. Change me. Change what's going on in my life. And we can read it and we can know stuff. Religious people know this book but don't necessarily have 
that relationship with the Holy Spirit, that filling with the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we know this here. But when done in partnership with the Holy Spirit, man, this is what happened with Jesus. Even the devil knows the scriptures because Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And the devil comes at him with scriptures that were twisted, manipulated in order to tempt Jesus. The devil and the demons know this book. The religious people of Jesus, they, know this, they knew this book. They come at him about the Sabbath day. And Jesus responds, has to respond to them. About the Sabbath day, they, they made up this religion around rules and regulations. And they knew the letter of the law, but they didn't know the spirit in which it was given, the context in which it was given. This book is alive. God has breathed his breath of life on this word. It is his word. It is alive and active, the book of, of Hebrews tells us. Paul, writing to Timothy, says... God has breathed this into being. But we need the Holy Spirit to unpack stuff. Give me just a few more minutes. Number one, he, en he enlightens us to who Jesus is. Number two, he energizes us to live for him and what he's calling us to do. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water. But one is coming greater than I. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Worship team, you can come. I'm going to try and wrap this up. I was sitting, I've spent last week at the, at the Elam conference in Harrogate. See, what, what happens is that very often, do you ever just get tired? Do you ever just get worn out? And, and you just need something fresh. You just need something fresh. Is there ever a moment whenever you never have to refill your car with fuel? You never have to do it. Filled it once, job done. Don't have to do it again. We have to constantly go back and refill the cars. And it's the same with us. I was sitting on the runway on Tuesday, heading over to Harrogate for the Elam Conference. And as I'm sitting, I'm at the window of the plane. And I can see there's a plane just across from us. And people coming off the plane. And there is the one that landed. And they're going into the, into the terminal. And then I see in the, the, the stewardess, she stopped people getting off the back of the plane. I'm like, what's she stop people for? What, what's she doing? And then I looked to the right of her, and the, the plane was being refilled with fuel. And the guy had put in the pump, and then he walked away, and he'd left it. And all the fuel was spewing out of the back of the plane. It had been filled to overflowing, and it had taken all that it could, and it's now gushing out onto the runway where the people are supposed to be getting off the plane, and it's just flowing out. And like that's the Holy, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with us, to fill us and to continually, Paul says, be filled. In other words, be filled and keep being filled because what happens is it's a flow where it flows in and it flows out. It's the flow of the Holy Spirit. It's him flowing through us, flowing in and flowing out. Whatever we take in, we're supposed to give away. What happened on the day of Pentecost didn't just stay in the upper room. It overflowed into the streets and 3,000 people get saved under the surface sermon of Peter. This is Peter who kept messing up every time he opened his mouth. In the first sermon that he preaches on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people get saved because there was an overflow. It spilled out into the streets. God wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit, not just for you, but so that it can flow out of you. And what happens is whenever we don't come back and look, God, I want more. I want more of you. Then we will get dry. We will get worn out. We will get tired. The last thing that he wants to do in filling us is to equip us and empower us. You will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He wants to equip us and empower us for the job ahead, for the work ahead. Yes, job, work. Oh, but it's great. I wonder if you do it under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, then, oh my goodness, he wants to fill you. He says, you will be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be filled with power. That word dunamis, from that we get the word dynamite. Sometimes I, you know, I, one of the reasons why I stand at the front here is because I don't want to look at you whenever we're doing worship. 
Because sometimes whenever we're doing worship, people stand and about with their hands in their pockets. And I'm like, we're worshiping Almighty God. We're singing about breakthrough. Just like the walls came, just like the walls came down, Jericho. Need a smoke. Listen, I don't apologize for this. I don't apologize because we've got to get past the point of the fear, the anxiety, the lethargy, the apathy. And if we want breakthrough, then breakthrough comes through war. You will not get breakthrough with standing with your hands in your pockets. And whatever Jesus says, you'll be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Dynamite. Greater is he that lives in you than he that is in the world. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He wants to equip you and empower you to fill you to overflowing. To fill you. I believe that we should be the most passionate people on the face of the planet. I believe that people should be looking and going, wow, I want some of that. I want some of that. Did you see the change in, in her? Did you, did you see the change in him? Wow, I want some of that for me. Do you think I could get that? Think that I could have some of that? We should be living our lives in such a way that whenever people look at us, they should be saying, can I get some of that? Power of the Holy Spirit. When you read through the book of Acts, you will see the Holy Spirit at work in power, healing, delivering, setting free. And what he was doing in the, in the book of Acts, he still does today. He still does today. Will you stand to your feet with me, please? Sometimes the fire goes out and sometimes the oil runs out. We need to add more wood, more fuel to the fire, replenish the oil. We need the wind of the Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, took some young people down. We built a fire down in Jordanstown. And later on in the night, the fire was beginning to go out. We lay down beside the fire and began to blow into the fire. It was just embers. But what it did was it ignited because the wind... The wind was blowing and was catching the embers and was igniting the embers. God wants to breathe afresh on you today. God wants to breathe afresh. He wants to fill you, to baptize you, to breathe on you. The fire, the wind, the oil, freshness today in the name of Jesus. Come and worship, Tyler. Don't wait on me. Come and worship. Church, let's worship. You know what? God wants to fill you. You want to come front, come to the front, come to the front. You want to be filled, you want to be baptized, you want a fresh fire, a fresh oil, a fresh anointing, you want breakthrough. God has parted the waters. You and I just need to walk through. The waters are parted. You need to walk through. God wants to move in your life today by the power and anointing of His Holy Spirit. If that's you today, you're saying, yes, I want, I want prayer. I want to be filled. I want to be baptized. You come to the front right now. Prayer team will pray for you. I'll pray for you. I want to pray for the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit.